All right, ladies and gentlemen, nice to see you back again. Um, I hope you had enjoyed the interval. Right, we have a wonderful second half for you, uh, followed by more music, more bar, more bookstore, more exhibitions, so lots to enjoy. Please welcome to the stage now, again with Kate Mossman, Verve Albertine. Hello. <laughs> is my mic still working? Yes, it is. <laughs> Hi, Viv. How are you? <laughs> no, I've just seen the, the yellow panel out there, which is all like the Sex Pistols, the Buzzcocks, you know. Uh, there's no mention of the female bands. Well, there is now. There if is you want now. to go around and have a look. <laughs> <laughs> what did you do? <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I can't believe, you know, it, it's a fight that honestly never, ever ends. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. It still seems to be... Um, I'm know, only here for the money. <laughs> and that's the same as before as well. You do see the... Uh, yeah, in, the, in the, a lot of the documentaries about punk, the women are always a little epilogue, aren't they? And women were in it too. Yeah, and yeah. women were the best thing about it. Yeah. They were the revolutionary thing about it, mm. really. Mm. Um, you know. I wanted to ask you that there's a fantastic line in your, um, in your very brilliant book, um, which I just wanted to start with, because I think it's a... It should be a line for all young bands now to listen to. This is part of the kind of um, the maxim of punk, as far as you're concerned. It is unnecessary to add another band to the world if it isn't doing something different or better than bands that already exist. Yeah, that's what me and Sid said when we were standing at the back of a Sex Pistols concert <clears throat> in um, the screen on the green is in Islington. And we, you know, we said there is absolutely no point in adding more fodder. Mm -hmm. ear fodder to the world, you know, or eye fodder in a way, you know, yeah. more ripped jeans, more leather jackets, more snarls, more, you know, 12 bar chord structures. Um, and that's what we thought. Um, but the slips really followed it through. Whereas, you know, bands like <coughs> the Pistols and the Clash were still rock bands playing those formula, uh, those rock formulas and, you know, sort of copying mm. the whole way of moving and etc etc that they had role models we didn't so you know not one slit grew up thinking that one day i'm going to be in a band you know there was mm. no miming in front of the mirror posing about thinking you oh, know where would a guitar look good on me for the slits so because we came with such fresh minds because there were no girls we could follow that we thought of that we didn't know of any anyway um i think you know we, we brought not only a really sort of fresh take but we were much more rigorous than a lot of the boys as well so in, in, in our songwriting, in our politics, yeah. etc. Yeah. So when you were a teenager, you really didn't think it was a, an option to I be in a group? I didn't think. It was like thinking of another dimension. I mean, mm. I didn't even think of it. It, it. I mean, I brought up in a council flat, went to a comprehensive school, one of the first ever comprehensive schools. Um, by then, I'd already been damaged by, you know, dysfunctional old family, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, by the time I was a teenager, I had sort of no self-worth, as most, most people who were gravitated towards punk didn't have any confidence, and um, were dysfunctional in some way or another, um, which has become more and more apparent as we've got older. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, so, I mean, you know, who was I going to look at? I mean, I, I knew about Susie Quattro, like Susie Quattro, but I wasn't an idiot. I was reading Enemy and Sounds. I, I knew she was sort of manufactured by Mickey Most. You know, I looked at the raincoats, sort of, uh, not the raincoats, sorry, girls, um, at the runaways, open-mouthed, um, you know, and thought, oh, my God, you know. Do I have to look like that? To... <laughs> yeah, they, well, no, not do I have to look like that to be in a band? I just thought they, they, they weren't, it didn't even trigger anything in me that that's something I could be, you know, in their corsets and their sort of jailbait, you know, Kim Fowley put them together. So mm. they were no different to me. I was no more fooled by them than I was by, you know, Sandy Shaw or anyone who'd been manufactured, basically, mm. you know, Bay City Rollers. I was no, you know, not that they came after, I think, I can't remember. But anyway, yeah, so, you know, they just looked as manufactured as everyone else. So it didn't trigger in me, I could be that, because I wasn't 15-year-old jailbait, probably, or because I couldn't play an instrument like Susie Quattro or have that sort of American confidence that she had. I wasn't a genius like Joni Mitchell. You know, there was nothing to trigger me yeah. until I saw the pistols, really. But, I mean, it's, I'll probably ramble, you have to shut me up or jump in. But, um, 
you know, people often say, oh, what made you pick up a guitar? Then, you know, it's 1975, 76, when there were no girls to follow. You couldn't play, you couldn't sing, you came from working class background. Um, and it would be so neat and sexy to say, oh, it was the night I saw the Sex Pistols. But, you know, whenever you look over, back over your lives and think, and you think, you know, how did I come here? It's never one big light bulb moment, you know. Mm. There are all these threads building towards, you know, me be, being a slit. Um, Patti Smith was a influence. Yeah, you know, the Patti Smith record, you know, but which, which uh, the picture of Patti Smith in um, Sounds or NME, it probably was the shark, Charles Shell Murray, who, who John mentioned, but it was probably him, I think, writing about her. And to see this picture of a, a young woman, who, and I thought, it's that thing you don't know, you missed it until you've seen it. I saw this picture of this young woman who, it looked what we'd call nowadays gender fluid, you know, half mm. boy, half girl. My God, that, I thought, that's how I feel inside, but she looks like it on the outside. But I never realised before why I felt so uncomfortable, because I felt half boy, half girl inside, half aggressive, you know, half this, you know, the stereotypes in the 70s of what was boy and girl were extreme, very binary. Um, and, you know, so that was a big thing, let alone her music on top of that, because, again, it's just incredible to think that I... Even probably at the beginning of the slits, thought girls shouldn't make a noise when they had sex. Nice girls don't make a noise when they have sex. Yeah. Um, and then to hear Patti Smith grunting and growling, and she was obviously a very private person, very intelligent person, very poetic, very well read. But I'd never heard, ever heard, a female let go. I mean, there were no, almost no female athletes at the time, you know, you know even if I'd seen them, I mean, we had one TV channel, so there was nowhere that was hearing a girl let go or seeing a girl let go or see a grunt that she threw a javelin or in a tennis match or, you know, they weren't televised. No, there was nowhere to feel that you could let go. And I used to look at boys just sort of play fighting sometimes, you know, older boys, boys 19 and 20 at art school, and wish I could let go like them. Yeah. Was it about wanting to be a boy at some point, do you think? Um, I never wanted to be a boy but I was furious at the um, lot I was given as a girl, you know, periods um, being shut out, uh, being overlooked, looked past, never looked in the eye, still happens now. Mm. Um, yeah, it, I was furious about it. I never wanted to be a boy, though. Yeah. Why were you um, reluctant at first to join the Slits? Um, well, the Slits existed before me with Kate Co Chorus on guitar, um, and... You know, it just seems incredible to say now, but I thought, oh, feminism has come so far that I don't need to be in an all-female band. In fact, you know, maybe that's over-egging it. I, you know, I, it was actually an incredibly new thing to be in a mixed band, even. I mean, when I was walking down Portobello Road, holding hands with Mick, who was my boyfriend at the time, Mick Jones, we were at art school together, and um, Sid Vicious and John Rotten came walking towards me, and I immediately dropped Mick's hand, you know, mustn't look wet, <laughs> they're trying to, trying to kind of appear like a whole person instead of mixed girlfriend. I, mm. I didn't have a guitar, I couldn't sing or play. I wanted to be still seen as a whole person, um, which seems quite radical still now, in a way. Um, still girls are fighting for that. But, um, and and um, I said, my granny's died and left me 200 quid and I'm going to buy a guitar. And um, this boy called Sid, who I didn't know, said, oh, I'll be in a band with you. <laughs> and, and that moment, that was a big moment, actually, because I saw Mick Jones and Johnny Rotten's mouth sort of drop open. And, and I thought, God, that's brave of him, because girls and boys weren't in bands together then. And not, this was the Flowers not, of Romance. That's the Flowers of Romance, yeah. So, you know, I said, what do you play? And he said, saxophone. And Johnny Rotten sort of went <laughs> like that. <laughs> But it didn't matter then, it did not matter if you played or didn't play. If you looked right, if you had the right attitude, you were in the band, um, which was so fantastic, which was this little crack opened up for a minute where yeah. you, you could be disabled, you could be ugly, you could be unmusical, but you could still be in that elevated space on stage being looked up at, not clapped, okay, spat at, but... <laughs> um, you know, you could be in the music business, or you could be in a band. Is know. it true that there were journalists actually sniffing around you and Sid before you'd even written a song or played a gig? Yeah, but then we didn't ever write a song or play a gig. <laughs> but yeah, we, we'd go around because we looked so extraordinary and we, people would come up into us in pubs and say, oh, when are you going to play a gig? What's your band called? And we say, Flowers of Romance. Yeah, we'll let you know when it's, you know, maybe we'll give you an invite. You know, we never played a gig. And, and it's amazing we're still talking about that band that doesn't exist. <laughs> and that, that is pure punk, I think, you know, 40 it's years moment, later. It's a moment, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's still being talked about as if it existed, you know. <laughs> um, I got chucked out. 
I mean, to be chucked out of a band that can't play anyway. <laughs> um, yeah, so that was gutting. That was the worst thing that ever happened to me for a very long time, to be chucked out, you know, to have sort of found your people mm. and then be chucked out of that. But then I saw the Slits play uh, in Harlesden. Um, I, I, well, loads of bands were playing that night. Clash, Buzzcocks, Subway Sect. <clears throat> but I went to see the Slits, who were on first, because... They were girls. Mm. And I've seen all the other bands and I knew what they were about. And, it, you know, I got so blasé, I wouldn't even turn up at Clash gigs or Pistols gigs because, you know, they were just mates and uh, whatever. But I went to see the Slits and not expecting anything at all. And I was absolutely, I don't know, elevated by them because um, that, what you started with, you know, it's not worth being in a band unless it's better or different than bands that have gone before. That was the Slits. Mm. That, you know, Ari, who was 14, the singer on stage, had a sort of lack of self-consciousness, a wildness that not only rivaled Johnny Rotten or, or, you know, or Tina Turner or anyone, but absolutely exceeded it. Mm. She would never seen anything like the way... This girl, I mean, she was 14 from Bavaria in Germany, that area, and she was like a Caspar Hauser type. <laughs> I don't know if Tessa would agree, Tessa's there, the bass player. <laughs> um, you know, she, she, she was self-imagined. There was no, you know, she still had pit, so, um, posters of ponies on her wall. There was no <laughs> wanting to be David Bowie, wanting to be Susie Quattro for Ari. <laughs> she had invented herself from scratch, looking at animals <laughs> and listening to birds and seeing something on the street or hearing a car go by that's how she made up her vocal style mm. you know and we were just talking earlier about palm olive on drums absolutely feral um and and everyone who came to see the slits you know so eventually i badgered them until they let me join after <laughs> and you know i rang them up the next day and said oh, i thought you were really great and when i put the phone down apparently they all went oh now she's interested <laughs> But it's funny, I have this thing that when I really want something, all my pride goes out the window. Uh, I just thought they were extraordinary. And the whole being all girls thing was completely irrelevant. They were just extraordinary in their own right. I like the fact that you said that um, if Ari had a bad day, she felt fine about showing that on stage. And it's a bit similar to what you said about when you first saw Johnny Rotten, that he looked pissed off up there. And that yeah. was different, wasn't it? We didn't want to be showbiz. You know, if you had a bad day or you're depressed or, you know, whatever, Ari would just come on stage and be grumpy all through the set, wouldn't she? And, you know, I, that's how I feel now. I'm pissed off about <clears throat> that thing over there. And I don't want to pretend, you know, I, I wasn't schooled to be entertaining. Mm. We, we were schooled to be, you know, by Malcolm and Vivian in a way and other things we'd read and I'd been at art school and drawn to, you know, confrontational artists. To, we were schooled to be agitators. Mm. You know, and it didn't actually matter what the medium was. The only reason in the half of us chose that medium, guitars, and was the only one we could get in. And it still is in some ways, but almost not because it's become so upper middle class now. You know, it, the art's still just about you can sneak in a different way without your degree and your, you know, your social standing, whatever, whatever. Mm. But then for those 18 months, it really was a matter of get your foot in that door and yeah. don't be told no. There's a lovely moment where you, you describe the, um, the, a, a state of kind of physical confidence that you reached with the slits where you, you <coughs> say you, you almost felt like you had fur on. Did I? Yeah, <laughs> that you were kind of... It I, wasn't I have about, pretty hair. It, it wasn't was about, it. yeah, looking pretty necessarily or fashion or anything, yeah. but you felt sort of so strong yeah, in I, yourself. I do remember, and I still remember, walking down the street thinking, I feel a bit like Patti Smith. I look on the outside how I feel on the inside confrontational, a bit angry, you know, a bit playing with my sexuality. It's nothing to do with prettiness or beauty or thinness or anything. It's just like I perfectly embody where my head is at mm. on the outside. I mean, and almost nobody does that. Almost nobody dresses how they feel. Yeah. If they did, I would now have knives. <laughs> <laughs> how much was that galvanised, that feeling, by the kind of attitude you were getting from... Mm. Uh, people coming up to you on the street and because you were you were fighting a fight all the time with the slits oh my you? god we're still recovering um 40 years later um how does how did it galvanize um i don't know i i just feel that because we were four we 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 had a certain protection and we felt we really had a mission we weren't naive about it we, we knew what we were doing we knew we were fighting to change things for girls 
we, we really were very passionate about our mission and it didn't matter, it wasn't just about how we looked, it was um, how we wrote a song, um, what the rhythm of the song was, how the chords progressed or didn't progress, what note followed what note, the melodies, the accent we sang in, the words we used, every single thing the slits did was broken down, ripped apart, right down to ground zero. Mm. And we, we would even stand in rehearsal, uh, our, you know, a rehearsal studio, whatever, not that it was a studio squat, and um, talk about, well, what height should I have the guitar? Because there it doesn't look right with the mini skirt, and there it doesn't look right, da, da, da. Because we'd never seen girls with guitars before. We looked, everything was new, you know. Should I stand with my legs open? No, I'll stand like a bloody rock and roll bloke with big bollocks dangling down. <laughs> you know, what's a new way to stand that isn't macho? Or, or you know, so it was exhausting. Mm -hmm. You know, whereas other bands just went in and, you know, I'll just lower it two notches down, and I'll, snarl, and I'll be like, you know, Scotty, what's it? Or I'll be like whoever. No, we, we, we were rewriting. Mus not musical history, but sort of pop mm. history. Well, John was talking earlier about um, the violence being just a part of, of life at that point, and the slits were very much on the receiving end of that. Mm. I mean, there's all sorts of um, misogynists who wouldn't actually knife... I mean, Ari was knifed, wasn't Ari was she? Ari stabbed why at least twice yeah, why in my presence. Why did that happen to the band? Um, we were so... It's just very simply, we were just so incredibly threatening that it... it drove people to violence. Um, and I, I suppose you threaten people, and if they don't feel powerful or if they feel their power's been taken away, they turn to violence. I mean, it's, that just still happens. You know, we're not that evolved. Mm. And to see a bunch of girls walking four abreast down the street dressed partly in S&M gear that you've only got in a few magazines tucked at the bottom of your wardrobe, and then partly in old men's boots, and then partly with children's clothes on top of them, and then with this horrible sneer on their face, and as you walk by looking at them, they go, fuck off and gob at you. Um, <laughs> it was too many mixed messages, mm. which was absolutely, that's what I meant, we were there to agitate, we were there to fuck with their heads, and, you know, my very uh, sort of quotable quote is, you know, they didn't know whether they wanted to fuck us or kill us. Mm. and mostly they wanted to kill us and because they probably you... thought they couldn't fuck us because we were good fighters. Yeah, and when you joined the band, you, you actually felt, I want them to want to be us rather than yeah. want to fuck us. So <coughs> it, was, it was a different I had spent kind of my whole, you know, from probably age 11, looking at boys in bands, you know, looking, looking at them to guide me. I went, my, my junior school in Muswell Hill, the kinks were like five years ahead of me. You know, I, I would think I'm following in the footsteps of the kinks. Not that I was ever going to be in a band, but somewhere, somewhere in, in my life, there was someone who'd made something different of themselves. And um, so, you know, from 11 onwards, I, I was trying to copy them. Well, not copy them, but, you know, copy bands, copy the way they looked, and maybe the way they stood, this, that, or the other. Um, not, as a, not as a musician, but just as someone who was living a more interesting life. Yes. And then I thought, when we made a band, I want boys to want to be us, not want to fuck us. You know, I want them to think, which was unheard of in those days, I want a boy to say, I want to be in that gang with those girls. You know, that's why Sid Vicious saying, I'll be in a band with you, was a huge moment. Yeah. Where a cool boy would want to be in a band with a girl. I mean, let alone the fact there weren't any girls in bands, but, um, yeah, so... Yeah, I wanted them to copy us. I didn't, we didn't want their sexuality. We, would, we didn't want to be wanked over or anything. We wanted them to want to be us, to, you know, which almost could only happen now, a gender fluidity and everything, you know, but we, to copy our clothes, to yes. copy. We did have a whole gang who followed us from Liverpool, I know Hillary's here tonight, who turned into Frankie Goes to Hollywood and uh, Big in Japan, um, who, a bunch of boys who did copy our hair and, you know, our clothes and everything, and did follow us around, you know, all over the country. And what kind of guys were they? They were beautiful. It was Paul Rutherford from Frankie Goes to Hollywood and, um, you know, Budgie, who ended up being in our band for a bit. There was, a, you know, a lovely bunch of very trans, you know, very fluid, gender-fluid boys. Another thing you were, you were up against was, um, obviously, because Ari was so young. Yeah. I mean, tell me about the White Riot tour, which is famously 77, wasn't yeah. it, with the, the well, Clash? Yeah, the, I, the first, yeah, the first gigs we ever properly played. In fact, we, we were asked to go on the White Riot tour with the Clash and the Buzzcocks and a few other bands. We'd never played any gigs before. Um, Ari was 14. I mean, she had to be pulled out of her school. Well, she wasn't pulled out. We, she just went. 
Um, the 70s were a bit lawless in that way. I mean, <laughs> and again, you know, if anyone tried to attack Harry on stage, which they did a lot. I mean, she really did trigger things in, in, in guys. And quite often guys would rush the stage and try and pull her off and attack her. And we, we'd all unplug our guitars, you know, great big slabs of wood, heavier than that table, and whack them over the heads with it. And they'd be carted off bleeding by the bouncers. But no one would ever go to the police. You know, Harry was stabbed a couple of times. We were attacked all the time. We'd never go to the police. It, it, they were lawless times. I'm not saying they were good for that, mm. but we, we were very street smart, you know, uh, and as John said, you know, it's amazing we came through it without being killed. Mm. Um, it's amazing at the same time as that, you had people trying to tell her to go to bed at half ten because she was only 15. Well, <laughs> very rarely did her mum say that, you know. <laughs> In fact, I've only worked out recently that actually none of the slits really had a father present, which was, I think, very portentous. Um, because I don't think in the, six, you know, in the 70s there, if us girls had had a father present in our lives, one that we'd loved or one that we were fighting against, I don't think we could have lived those wild, free, on the streets, shouting, rampaging lives mm. we lived. Um, for one reason or another, you know, we, we weren't in close proximity to our fathers. Mm. Um, and I think that's quite interesting. And our mothers also, actually. We, we were almost Dickensian orphans, actually. And possibly one of the first generations to have divorced parents, yeah. because it wasn't, you know, it's no. going back. Yeah. It's something you but didn't But it was do. still not the done thing. Mm. So, you know, if you were the child of divorce, you were still, you were actually quite an outsider. Because mm. when my mum and dad divorced, it was the same time as uh, Wallace Simpson. You know, who was scandal. a scandal to be divorced. You know, there was people at the pinnacle of the country not being allowed to rule because they were divorced. So, yeah. yeah. So, you know, it was, it was still very much not the done thing. And, you know, everyone drawn to punk. The interesting thing is everyone drawn to Vivian and Malcolm's shop, which was sort of was the epicenter in a way. We were all damaged people. We were all fragile one way or another. And, you know, nowadays we get asked to do these talks and things. And... We don't, still don't really behave and we, we still don't really deliver like we should deliver. And, and the thing about musicians now so much is they look the part, but then you can also talk a bit about Latin with them and you can also talk about football. And you, can, you know, <laughs> that's the people that are being young boys who are being signed up now. It, it, it's not the real dirty, broken thing that we were. And, and of course, no record company, no, you know, no one wanted to touch us which is why I haven't done anything except this at the punk year, because we, we were, you know, pariahs, mm. and we still are fucked up. Mm. Um, One it, of the things that you capture so, so well is this, um, and it, I think maybe people forget this about, this about punk, but how merciless everyone was with each other and how critical of the bands yeah. and how, you, you know, if you didn't stick to your commitment, then you weren't... You, you get out, you know, you, yeah. you don't have a and show. I, I think that attitude very much filtered down from Vivian Westwood, who, who was ruthless <laughs> in her criticism and her expectations. Um, it was quite interesting in a way. It, you know, she was only about four or five years older than us, but so, you know, you couldn't really quite say she was a maternal figure, but she was like, so she expected the best from you. You know, I remember once she said to Sid, oh, Viv's talented, but she's lazy. I hadn't even been in a band or anything. You hadn't done anything yet at that point. I hadn't done anything, but for her to say I was talented, I knew I was lazy. <laughs> but, you know, she made me anyway, and I think a lot of us, reach up way beyond. Because she was northern, she was working class, she was a tough thinker, she told it straight. She had a massive influence on how we all thought, mm. you know. She wasn't, an old, she wasn't playing the part of mentor, but, you know, you, you gather around people. And, then, and there was... There was Malcolm, you know, who was also very well read, very smart, thought, you know, outside the box or whatever, and, um, you know, brought a lot of different art, art movements and political movements and the theory of it, you know, just lightly would mention it, you know, and then I'd go off down Compendium and nick the book that was, you know, about the <laughs> Giruti or whoever he'd mentioned, you yeah. know, or situationism or whatever. That's why Compendium shut. <laughs> because it's still, All the punks were going in there. And everyone was stealing from there. It was in Camden Town. Yeah. Well, I've heard Johnny uh, Rotten say before, you know, they were the adults. Was there that feeling, a bit like they were there kind of parental? There was a bit of feeling they were the adults, but not uncool adults. And, you know, and other things like that, you never saw them hold hands. You saw no physical contact between Malcolm and Vivian at all. No one knew they had a child. Um, <laughs> I think he was locked in his room the whole time. <laughs> Under the but, stairs. Yeah, so, um, but, 
yeah, we, 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 you know, we sort of were greedy and hungry to sort of find people that we could be inspired by because there was no TV, you know, they, they, they weren't in the papers. I mean, for me, the moment I saw um, Patti Smith, I was inspired. You know, the moment I saw Vivian Westwood, I was inspired. Yeah. I was greedy to grab something. And I'd never seen a working class woman be confident in my life before, um, mm. and let alone be an artist. Mm. So that was another huge thing. I mean, just to say the way Vivian, you know, to actually see the way Vivian made her clothes, which I saw quite close up because I was hanging out with a guy called Rory, who was um, Malcolm's assistant. She would get a pile of old T-shirts sent from India or somewhere, cheap as anything, and she'd get them out of the box and go, oh, fuck's sake, you know, the, the sleeves are horrible, you know, because necks and sleeves were very important back then. Um, so a neck or a sleeve on a T-shirt was not to be. So she would say, oh, God, OK, cut them off, just cut them off, can't be bothered to sew them, can't sew anyway, I'm not going to spend my life sewing, leave them ragged, it's too long, cut the bottom off, and then just, you know, think of the most outrageous thing or, or something intelligent and screen print like that on the front. And it, it seeped into me that... It didn't matter how good I was at anything. I didn't have to be a virtuoso player. I didn't even have to be able to play. I had to have ideas. I had to have something to say. Um, and I think that helped me be able to write songs. Like, no way, I would thought I could write a song. My kid has had, you know, piano and bass lessons since she was six. She's too frightened to write a song at 17. You know, and I, I think, oh my God, what have I, I've created a monster. Because everyone I know who's trained in music can't write a song. And yet, we all wrote songs because of how Vivian approached life and how she approached art, and because she was working class. Um, well, didn't Sid teach himself to play bass overnight? Yeah, I mean, that's another Listening to a Ramones yeah, I mean, Sid had a very good ear, actually. He, listened to, he was up on speed all night, one night in the squat in um, Shepherd's Bush, and got up in the morning, and the bastard had learned to play bass. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's, it's tortoise and the hare, because Sid was very musical. He had a great ear. He had a sort of, sort of a confidence that I didn't have, even if it was bluffed. Um, he had a good brain, but in the end, he wasn't radical. So I, I was absolutely, you know, I won't, I won't lie, I was gutted when he learned to play bass overnight. And, and, you know, I'm struggling to try and hold a chord down and I can't be bothered to do the work you have to do to do it. Do it. But I think that's what's in, interesting and what young people who sort of fetishise punk or whatever don't understand, that it wasn't all these sexy moments. Mm. It was sometimes a matter of persevering or hanging on in there or the, being the one with the ideas or not being the one who went down... The heroin route, you know. Why was he not radical? Because he went down the heroin route. Yeah. And that's, you know, and then you can trace that back to his mother who was a heroin addict. He didn't have a father. I mean, you mm. know, if you've got one strong person in your life when you're growing up, I think you can more or less make it through. Mm. Sid didn't have that. He yeah. had no foundation. Um, a turning point for you um, was when uh, there was the incident with him throwing a, a glass Mm. Uh, uh, and a young fan got injured in the eye. Tell me yeah. about that. Why was that so important for you? I mean, it was, it was some, it was, I can't remember what it was called, some sort of, I don't know if it was, the word punk was being used by then because we all refused to use it, but it was some sort of festival down at the 100 Club and two or three nights in a row. And on the second night, the damned were playing. And, and you know, we all went because we had nowhere else to go. And the, at some point, Vivian came up to me and said, oh, Sid's been arrested and taken. I honestly had no idea it had happened. And I, what? Sid's been arrested? Oh, he's been picked on, you know. And, yeah, because the glass had been thrown and, you know, it's hit somebody. Da, 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 da. I mean, it only emerged later that the young woman lost her eye. But when I found, first of all, you know, I was against that sort of violence. Not because I'm a nice, good person or anything, but it just doesn't, you know, resonate with and me. And he didn't to admit to it at first, did he? No. I mean, I went a long time thinking Sid was innocent, visiting him at Ashford Remand home. Never seen him, you know, so broken. He, he was a changed person. I mean, maybe that's the moment that he broke, actually, mm. in a way, because he, he had none of the confidence, none of the arrogance. It, it was gone. There was a little frightened boy sitting there who, who was terrified, absolutely terrified. Um... Yeah, and, you know, not long after that, he joined the Pistols, and it was just downhill from there. Mm. He joined the Pistols, you know, not one thing, joined the Pistols, threw the glass, blinded a girl in one eye, as it turned out, um, you know, met Nancy Sponge. And it's, it's all these things that come together, in, you know, had a junkie mother, all these kind of things, you know, add 
the picture of mm. a person. They're not black and white, you know. You talk quite um, movingly in the book as well about realising that the people who were into heroin sort of had a... They were able to sniff out people who were vulnerable and might, might start. So, for instance, when you, when you took it yourself at one time, um, and you had, a, you had a bit of an epiphany after that, didn't you? You kind of went to the slits after that one heroin yeah. experience that you had. Yeah, I mean, as I said, we were all quite vulnerable people one way or another. And even now, I could say, I need something to get me through. You know, and we were all vulnerable, we were all raw. And for some people, you know, they got tempted towards heroin. Some have been tempted towards religion. Um, my, my, my drug was romantic love. I, I looked to, you know, to love, the partner to love, you know, um, as my saviour to make me feel all right about the world, you know. And I'd so given up on that. I'm, I'm now looking back at heroin and religion <laughs> <laughs> as a better option, at least a slightly more together. reliable, <laughs> yes. So, yeah, so, I mean, that's, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's you know, there's... There's certain areas of society that attract people who are damaged, which is, you know, maybe why they write raw stuff or why they're willing to push a bit further and go mm -hmm. and be seen as something that doesn't fit in and take all the shit that comes with that. Um, but at the same time, of course, then they maybe need other sorts of help. Yeah. yeah. You, you talk about um, there being a, a, a prevailing kind of anti-emotion doctrine as well in punk. And I wonder, yeah. was that quite difficult as a young woman or a young person it generally to be around that. It was interesting to me because, you know, I, I like to question everything. I came, came from a broken home, parents who were foul to each other. Um, I'd been moulded in that. But at the same time, every day I was being played love songs non-stop from the radio, which I believed. I believed, you know, never going to let you go, my heart's breaking. I thought boys thought like that, and, and I, I just feel so duped, you know. And when, when I usually hear, you know, boy bands now doing it, I, I, I scream to my daughter, you know he doesn't really mean that, he's just trying to get your money. <laughs> boys don't actually think like that. Um, but I, I thought, you know, and especially my favourite was John Lennon, who actually did think like that? Um, he was. He would talk about his um, aunt and his mother, his aunt Mimi and his mother Julia, and, and then Yoko Ono. You know, to, to have a young man at that time in history talking so openly about his emotions, writing about them. This this revered man, you know, bigger than God. Um, it really made me think that there was a chance of this wonderful meeting a soulmate thing. And then all the music, 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 I was listening to night and day on the radio, saying, you know, love this, love that, and all sung by boys, how heart hurt they were, how heartbroken, what power you've got over them. Mm. So I had that one end of my mother and father, you know, killing each other on the other side. And who wouldn't drift towards the romantic dream, you know, given those two choices. No, I, I can be different to them, I can fall in love and all that kind of thing. I can't remember the question now. What was it? <laughs> the anti-emotion. Oh, the anti-emotion. Yeah, yeah, then to find Vivian Westwood and Malcolm McLaren, who was sort of at the, yeah. you know, was sort of focal point for a lot of us, um, you know, never touching each other, thinking that, you know, I don't think they ever said it was wrong, but they never did it. So it was observed by us, who were all very observant, that it was obviously uncool to hold hands in public, to kiss and smooch in public. To, and it was also began to be, you know, through Johnny Rotten, especially, and Sid, who were all constantly, you know, like two little boys in the school playground, you know, practically, not girls are smelly, but they wouldn't say it was girls, but it was all like, you know, bodily fluids, and I'd rather wank and do this. And, well, there's this sort of fantastic episode yeah. about Johnny Rotten just going, will you give me a blowjob? <laughs> Oh, yeah, my book, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, well, the conversation ran out. I think nothing's changed there. But <laughs> the conversation, I told my daughter, don't just have sex, don't do the sex just because the conversation's run out. <laughs> That's just an easy ploy. Yeah, you'd run out of things to yeah, say, yeah. basically. And, I mean, yeah, I still do that probably as well. But, yeah, so... Um, what I still love about your book is that sense of, um, it just takes you back to, even little things like personal hygiene in that, that yeah. day and age, the fact that, People wouldn't necessarily wash for a week at a time. Yeah, oh, no, we, we wouldn't wash. I mean, we would all be sleeping on each other's floors and in squats that possibly had cold running water. Um, there, there wasn't this, you know, the whole American vibe of being groomed didn't really come in until the 80s when people started sort of actually filing their nails and washing themselves. I mean, it, if you went on a tube <laughs> until easily into the 80s, English men stank. No Englishman 
until well into the 80s would wear deodorant. Absolutely not, you know. So, yeah, it was a very stinky, smelly place. <laughs> and we were used to it. And it, now I feel almost nostalgic. I hate nostalgia, yeah. but I feel slightly nostalgic for the bodily smells. <laughs> um, you know, and crispy pubic hair. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, we've all, we've all got pubic hair. It gets crispy if you don't wash it for a week. <laughs> Mick Jones, and I know this has probably been going down in the archives, had a pair of leather jeans from sex, which was li literally so crusty here, because he didn't wear pants from dribbles of piss, that it eventually broke. <laughs> it just broke like, like a plastic dish. Yeah. What's that hard plastic called? Got distressed. Yeah. And it, it literally broke till he couldn't wear it anymore. And he just piece came off. So, Tell me a bit about the... Um... And I let that go in me. <laughs> <laughs> That's the really upsetting thing. I never, we weren't informed. We weren't told make sure he washes it before it's, you know. Anyway, we were dirty, but... There was nothing to compare it to. Yeah. <laughs> Tell me a bit about the actual, um, the physical process of going down to sex, the shop, and how, you know, we were talking earlier about the, the T-shirts that are on display here and... Those clothes were quite expensive, weren't they? Mm. It wasn't that you could just go there and kit yourself out, and no. you probably wouldn't. The first time I came across the concept of spending a lot of money for clothes, because until then I dressed in um, from jumble sales, which was okay, because in the 60s it was like a bit vintagey, and you'd buy sort of 30s dresses or, or old things, you know, whatever. From, from um, and, and basically, I always say, you know, Britain was a very binary country back then, and it does seem to be heading that way again. Is that, it was a matter of, you know, you had your school uniform and then what you wore on a Saturday. You know, you had your school shoes and plimsolls. It, there was two of everything. You had the, you had the, you had the um, Beatles or the Rolling Stones. It, you had the ITV or BBC, if you were lucky. Um, so, yeah, so uh, what, was the, what was the question again? Yeah, so how, <laughs> how much would you budget? actually spend on a piece of oh, yeah, so we didn't spend money. The first thing I spent money on was Levi's when I suddenly realised it actually mattered what the cut of your jeans. So Levi's was the first thing. And then the next thing was Vivian Westwood's shop. And um, I would just get my grant, because I was at art school, go straight to the shop, buy two things, and then not eat for three months. <laughs> Literally, you know, you can see pictures of, you know, sort of scabby-faced, grey, <laughs> sunken thing, you know. And, and um, yeah, food was a real currency then. Mm. I mean, you know, we'd steal a bit, or we'd eat cornflakes every single day or you'd eat around someone's house, or I just was hungry all the yeah. time. How, how long could you get away with spending in the shop? Could you hang out there for three or four hours yeah. just chatting? You yeah. could spend there. It, it wasn't, it wasn't um, an easy place to be in, you know, because the people who worked there were friendly as they were. It was a bit scary. And, yeah, but as long as you, you, you had to be brave, you know. Vivian Westwood and other people, you know, around then, but especially Vivian and Malcolm, they didn't care who you were, what you'd done, what you looked like, what you believed in, as long as you had something to say and you were bold. You know, because I remember once being around Johnny Rotten's, there's a whole load of bloke, wobble, blokes wobble and everyone, and um, it was getting a bit heavy, and a couple of people said, oh, we're going to go now, and, and uh, I think Wobble said to me, you're going to go, Viv, and I said, no, I'm going to stay. And, uh, you know, just one thing like that could make you acceptable, mm. you know, that you weren't scared. I'm, I'm terrified, but, yeah, mm. you just had to be very, very brave. And that's just so very different to now, in a way, I think. Mm. Um, How long did it take thank you God, to... in a way, you don't have to be that brave now. Yeah, maybe you aren't, they're not fighting so mm. much against that kind of... How, How long did it take you to feel that you sort of belonged within that world? Um... I thought I felt more I belonged in myself at least, you know, it gave me permission to be myself. There, there wasn't, you know, we didn't all play the same style of music, we didn't all agree with the same sort of things. Mm. It wasn't a matter of it was, you know, cliquey in that way or that we were, you know, it was, that was the best thing about it. It allowed for different points of view, it allowed for in, intelligence. It was an intelligent grouping, mm. a li very loose grouping. And, and it, what was wonderful is it allowed me to feel like myself, but it only lasted about 18 months till. It began to be co-opted by the media and, yeah. you know, stupid bands copied it and were thought of as punks. And then, you know, things, it, it dissipated within 18 months, two years, it was yeah. gone. Yeah. What were your memories of the, of the boat day? Because we were yeah. talking to John earlier, yeah, he was actually on it. Yeah, because it was very different for John. Um, 
for, for me and the people I was with, I mean, I'd already felt punk or whatever it was called was finished, but with the glass throwing and um, the violence of that night and the girl being blinded. But for Rob from Subway Sect, who I was with, and, and Vic and Nora, actually, I mean, none of us were allowed on the boat. No friends of the pistols were allowed on the boat. I think they were, boat, they were allowed two friends each, and the rest was all long, hairy, um, you know, virgin record company people and um, journalists. So it was, in our eyes, a complete and utter sellout. Mm. And we went up onto London Bridge, and as it came over, uh, Vic threw an old hoarding down onto the boat. <laughs> I mean, it was also thoughtless and got arrested, and, you know, we ended up at the police station and all that. And then we ended up at Nora's later, and I didn't know there was a budding romance going on between Nora and John Rotten, but he came there later, and he was very unhappy with it mm. as well. Because they hadn't wanted to do it, apparently. I don't know. I can't remember, but I just remember he was not happy. Mm. And so from our point of view, it was absolutely... This is Malcolm has gone too far. He's sold him his soul to the devil, and it's shit. It's mm. fucked. You, were current, you, at that point, were going out with Rob from the subway set you were with, and didn't he feel as well that that was yeah, the day that, that it... that was the end for him. Yeah. yeah. What, was the, what was so special about the subway set? Um... <clears throat> What's so special? I mean, what was so special? I don't know. They were just good. They were just good. They were pure. They, 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 t they were intelligent. What they wrote about, you know, they were raw, but they weren't just cliched. Um, everything they did was thoughtful. Mm. Um, and they were so... They, 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 did, they had school trousers and a school jumper on. <laughs> I mean, they, was, they had no clothes. They, they were just unpretentious. They were great. They were the real thing. Mm. In a way, it shows you know, the, the many different ways in which you could be punk, that yeah, you could be exactly. romp from the subway yeah, set yeah, and still be yeah. crucial to it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you, could still, you could be polystyrene, you could be Susie Sue, you could be um, Ian Drury, you know. Mm. Well, what do you think? I was uh, talking to John earlier about the idea of the sort of misconceptions that people have about this very short, sharp period in history. What do you feel that you wish could kind of, you know, you wish you could correct people about? Um... It was, I don't know, I think they know now it was hard. I think a few more balanced things have been written. I mean, the slits were very written out, completely written out. Most of, most of the females were written out, except Susie, because she was so photogenic. Um, and the songs were sort of poppy. But, mm. you know, I think the slits very much, and I, I know Ari died thinking the slits got written out of history, and she would have liked to have seen, you know, how we have been sort of rediscovered, and I feel we've been rediscovered by the young, via the internet, who sort of, you know, assiduously sort of trace things back and, and realise it sort of started with the slits. Mm. You know, the female side especially of things. Um, they've maybe followed the female, you know, um, or, you know, or even Kurt Cobain saying about the slits or whatever. Mm. Um, so I feel like, yeah, we've, we've got our place in history back. Why do you think they were written out? I, th I think literally people who were writing, a lot of most people who were writing at the time, and certainly P DJs on the radio, where we would never be allowed, to, we, we were banned from all radio stations. They couldn't see us for fear. You know, you can't see through fear, whereas young men now, going through the internet, there's not, we're not frightening, we're not challenging anymore, so, you know, partly because they probably think we're dead anyway, but, you know, it's, <laughs> we're at the end of the line, you know, we're at the end of a cable. Um, it's not threatening now. Mm. Although I still manage to threaten men. Really? Yes. At my age. Why? <laughs> um, because sometimes you pick on the wrong middle-aged woman. <laughs> and guys on buses don't know that. Do you so, feel that anger is part of your life? The yeah, way it was very back much. Then? You know, I really like that John called his last book Anger is an Energy because that's all some of us had. We, we didn't have anyone saying, go on, dear, you're, you're good, you can do that, or get three A's at A-level, or you'll be great at you. We, we didn't have anything except fury and anger to, to motivate mm. us, a lot of us. That's all we had. And I think I'm really still running on that. I, I, I've, you know, sent to secondary modern school, you know, overlooked as a girl all the time, you know, t constantly failing. That's what I wanted to sort of, that's probably what I would sort of readdress is, you know, people say, oh, you know, they tell, tell your CV when they introduce you, oh, here's Viv, she's done this, that and the other. And I, and I wanted to, in my book, write the alternative CV, which was actually failure, 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 crap, 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 insecurity, <laughs> you know, put down, 
not believing in myself, um, um, because that is my real CV, not the few little moments where I managed to get through a gap and sort of make something. Um, so, yeah, I can't remember now. Sorry, mm. I keep forgetting. I go off on tangents. The idea of being able to preserve, and you've managed to preserve that anger all the way oh, through. The anger, so, yeah. yeah. I've still got it. I mean, my, my daughter, who's 17, says to me, Oh, God, Mum, anger's so old fashioned. <laughs> Um, and, you know, she, she would almost see anger as if I'm being a bit like a teacher. Instead of seeing it as something raw, because I've come from a, you know, housing estate, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and been expected nothing of all my life. Because she has no concept of that, she thinks anger is just what teachers do to you. Like scolding. Yeah. yeah. So if I say to someone, you talk once more through my fucking gig, I'll bottle you. <laughs> She thinks I'm being teacherish. <laughs> and instead of seeing how absolutely radical it is for a middle-aged woman with a telecaster to say that to a bunch of guys. Um, so, yeah, but I mean, she'll eventually, because the thing the young don't really have is an overview. And, uh, you know, they don't have an overview of history and yet. And, uh, mm. and I'm only getting it now, 30 years later, and realising, mm. oh, you know, things don't change overnight. So, you know, lots of things. I think I, 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 in my mind, have a cycle of 30 years. I think it's quite a big 30-year cycle, feminism, all this, all the other. Mm. So, you know, music even comes round in 30-year cycles. So, whereas the slits were all thinking, where the fuck is the ne next bunch of girl? You know, we thought we'd done our bit, you know, yeah. no one wanted to play us anymore. You know, Britain being such a small island then, so, so narrow-minded, is once you've done your bit musically or whatever, it was like, get off the island, because there's only two radio stations and two music uh, papers, so we haven't got time, you know, there was no room. So much as it, whereas in America you could be Sonic Youth and going round and round the States playing forever and ever and ever and really turning into rock gods, we, we were just built, you know, not interested not going to sign you, um, not going to play you, not going to write about you. Couldn't get anyone to write about one of our re-releases. You know, mm. the Slits Cut was re-released. No journalist wanted to do it. They're fucking irrelevant, they said. Mm. And yet the funny thing is that 40 years later, the band looks almost futuristic. Yeah. There hasn't really been anything Yeah, like we couldn't that. believe it. We thought, well, where are all these girls coming up? And eventually, about eight, nine years later, you know, the Riot Girl thing happened. But it just felt musically not to be as radical. I don't think much, you know, has been mm. as musically radical as the slits were. Mm. Do you feel, I mean, at least back to what we were saying before, do, do you feel that punk could happen now? <laughs> I get asked that so much because I do talks in um, universities and things, you know, art schools and stuff, and they all sit there like this all the way through. And then at the end, all <laughs> they want to know is, when's punk going to happen again? <laughs> and I get furious. <laughs> Because I've just told them what crap life it was living in the 70s. <laughs> in a, you know, for punk to happen again, girls, you'll have to be stabbed in the street again. You know, you'll have to not be able to walk from here to there. There'll be no buses, no buses at night. There'll be no Primark to buy a cheap T-shirt in. You know, there'll, there'll be no, nothing on TV, n no internet, nothing. You know, then punk will happen again. But it's like saying, when's, the world, when's World War II? It'll never happen the same way again. Mm. You know, why would you want history to keep repeating itself? You hopefully want it to move on. Don't be nostalgic and looking mm. back just for something that happened then. We can learn from it. We can appreciate the good points. You know, we can take forward stuff from it that was inspiring. But please, kids, don't want it to happen again. <laughs> Is there any way where you can almost see that sort of energy in a different art form or in a different part of society? Um, well, part, I must say that I'm talking about in the West because, you know, I, I think in very repressed regimes where you, a young woman who's trying to be a rapper can't leave her house in Af Af Afghanistan because she will be killed, you know, or bloggers are being killed because they're saying they're atheists or whatever. I mean, their music has that edge and that danger and you, you know you're willing to try and change minds with it but I'm talking about in the west mm. so you know I think the most I think one of the most interesting things I have got great faith in the younger generation is um gender fluid fluidity I think it's in, in, incredible you know it's great and sometimes these sort of gentle revolutions change things as much as you know for, like my daughter says it'd be old-fashioned now to go around banging kicking indoors and gobbing oh fuck you know, like, <laughs> you know it's not necessary in this climate, it's not doable in this climate because the internet has made us so global and so attached to so many things that mm. you could say it's dissipated or you could say it was a more zen style, sort of multiple rooted 
way of living now. Mm. And therefore, you, you know, by definition, you can't do binary things like that, us or them so much, which although that has happened a bit with Brexit, but even that mm. I think is more complicated than it has been made to look mm. us and them. You know, I've got very, very hard left voting friends who voted out, you Me know. Um, so even that is not as clear cut as as things were back then. Mm, mm. It just may not be a musical movement next no, time. Or, you know. I, I, no, I mean, you know, I'm tempted to say it's never going to happen for popular music in the West again. It, it has been commandeered by the children of the ruling classes, and how can they possibly make revolution, the children of the ruling classes, you know? So we may have to look to the third world to... And we may have to be enablers and not be the twats on stage with the guitars and their legs <laughs> apart. You know, what is radical about that? People say to me, you know, you know, what would you be doing or what would you play? I would not be in a band as a young woman now. You know, I, I, if I was a radical person, I don't think it's a radical medium. Mm, yeah, it's interesting. I don't think, even though I'm on stage, I don't think being on stage and being looked up at is radical. Okay, so this is the only one I've done this year. <laughs> you know, but it's at least a bit more intimate, you know, than, yeah. than just sort of singing something with a guitar in front of me and repeating something over and over every three minutes and then you <laughs> clapping and, you know, at least there's that. How do you feel when you are on stage now singing? I don't do it. You don't do it, yeah. I think it's naff. <laughs> I think it's not radical. Yeah. I think it's more radical to write a book and tell the absolute fucking truth mm. or to piss off a guy on the bus. I've got my, li I've got my, little, <laughs> I've got my little battles, I'm, you know. And you're writing a second book now? Yeah. <laughs> oh, I believed the reviews when they said I could write foolishly. <laughs> and you if can. I hadn't spent the advance, I'd be giving it back, Dan, where we are. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll see, yeah. Will it be a, a book about punk? No, I mean, it'll be written by someone who is angry still and tells the truth still. So if you can call that punk, it won't be about punk. It won't be about that time in history. But I think that is punk now, isn't yeah. it? <laughs> I think, as I, you know, I said to you earlier, I think Mary Beard is more punk than <laughs> Savages. You know, because Why she goes that? against the norm. She goes against the norm in how she looks. She dares to have long grey hair. And that, you know, she was absolutely vilified for being on TV with mm. long grey hair. Mm. You know, and uh, you know, may not agree with everything she says, but... She dares, she's brave. She's brave to say what she thinks and not be cowed. Mm. What do you uh, feel when you see bands like Savages? I'm not going to go into Savages because who, who cares about this band or that band? I could honestly just as equally talk about breakfast cereals. Um, you know, what do you think about the new organic? Well, it's actually got too much sugar in it. And, um, you know, I wouldn't touch sugar puffs or any of those. And anyway, they're my, made by conglomerates. I don't want to pull out bands, really. But I'm just saying Savages and Mary Beard because I think people need to reframe what they think is radical. Mm. And Savages are great and they're a great band. And, you know, as are, actually most kids can write really good music now. They've had so much practice. They've seen so much on the internet. They know how to write a good tune and how to do harmonies and how to make it rough and how to add this and that. But how many people know how to be f fucking different and stand out and go against the norm? Mm. Mm. At the risk of being nostalgic, which I know is something you don't mm. like. Um, I was Except wondering if you, could, <laughs> if you can you think of one moment when it most made sense to you what you were doing with Slits? Um, I, I don't know. I mean, there was a few moments. That moment walking down the street, feeling like my inside, my outside matched my inside, was was pretty huge. And then we played um, at Alexandra Palace, which was where I was brought up. I mean, I spent all my childhood kicking around. Alexandra Palace at night, you know, again, amazingly not attacked, um, nothing to do. And then to be on that slope of grass with thousands of people, I think it was a Rock Against Racism gig, playing to my hometown as a girl who'd never, ever conceived of being in a band or holding a guitar. Um, that was huge. Mm. To, to, you know, to be, it would, it would have been more acceptable if I'd become an astronaut because... I had no concept that I could ever be this thing that I'd grown up, you know, knowing was a way, a pathway, but had no idea how I could be part of yeah. it. And yet somehow, you know, so you have dreams and you chase dreams, but what had happened, you know, all my dreams had fallen through, but what had happened was something way beyond my ken, you know, something, that's the moment when I thought this is, I could never, and I was aware of it, I thought I could never have conceived 
if only I'd known as a kid that, you know, I, I would reach this. And it wasn't a matter of it was being famous or anything, but you know, it, was, it was a big, loads of bands were there, and it was a big, you know, big day, not because of the slits, but to be on my home turf, yeah. Alexander Palace, where I just hung out, you know, day after day after day. And having come back as something different, really. Well, it's come back as a, a guitarist. I mean, yeah. it was extraordinary <laughs> in a band. Good. Not just Fantastic. as a guitarist, but in a band. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's very hard to explain how extraordinary. You did a good job there. <laughs> that vision was. Yeah. And Thank you so yeah. much. Okay. Fantastic. We're going to do some questions now. Um, Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I just had them waving at me. <laughs> well, John. So, John is going to go. Actually, have you got a chair? There's a chair on the door. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, thank you, then. <laughs> so how many minutes of questions we have? Yeah, about, about, about five minutes or something. Cool. <laughs> OK. So um, who has a question for our illustrious guests? You see, this is always the awkward bit. They're always shy. Yeah. Yeah. Gentlemen down here. We can repeat. So, so John mentioned Sapland Paul Martin, the English version, which I'm also familiar with. But could I ask you both, what was your record of shame at the time? I remember <laughs> going on a boating holiday and buying It Takes Two to Tango, because I thought I would get it on square vinyl. I didn't, but I still bought it. So what was you, what was your record of shame at the time? Um. Well, I remember saying, Mick Jones saying to me in the squat, you know, what do you think is the best record that has been re released this year? And when you think Patti Smith and the Ramones and the Pistols had all been released that year, I said, um, this will be by Natalie Cole. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I was ashamed for that. <laughs> so I still love that song, though. Well, there you go, you see. Yes, but I, you weren't yeah. allowed to like no. those sort of things. But. I suppose mine was Magic Fly by Space, or was it Space by Magic Fly? I always forget <laughs> it, which is a Euro disco record. It was synthetic, and then I still like it now, so. Yeah. Uh, so, question for Viv. Um, I heard they do the grapevines, in my humble opinion, probably the greatest cover that has ever been recorded. And I was just wondering what it was about that song that made you guys choose it and make such a successful cover version. <laughs> I think we just sort of stumbled across it. I, I know, I mean, we knew it. I mean, I loved it. And I remember I, I loved the video that went with it because it was a very sort of unusual video. It, was, it had a black woman sort of dancing into a fisheye lens, seeing it on, on top of the pop. So, you know, it's not just one of the ones we covered, out of the three or four. But um, it got better and better live, as I remember. So um, I can't remember if Chris Blackwell or someone suggested, because I think they wanted that to be our A-side, our of our record and we said no we're not going to do a cover we're not going to compromise so it was a double a side um so that's sort of how it came about and um you know i felt a bit shy about i personally felt a bit shy about covering what i thought was one of the best records and still do of all time um a bit embarrassed about it but i can't believe that over the years it, it's played in a lot of a lot of dances and discos and and you know i, I I don't think it is good. And I, I remember, you know, us being very conscious when we sat, we couldn't afford um, horns, you know, to do grapevine. So we did it with our voices, grapevine, grapevine. And we made sure that we sang in our normal register because girls used to sing in very high breathy voices then. You know, another thing we were very strict about, the girls and boys' voices, you know, at that age, aren't that different that we all have to sing up here, you know, all the time. <laughs> so we, we always used to be, we used to say to each other, imagine you're shouting across a playground at a mate. You'd say, oi, Tess. You don't go, Tess. <laughs> oh, please, come over here. here. <laughs> you know, which is how girls sang then and still do a lot of them. But so if that's sort of partly how it came about. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Anyone else? This lady at the front here. Hi, this is a, a question for you. Um, I was really interested in your um, point about having to rethink being radical. I'm wondering how your daughter feels about that and if what you think about young girls that have got a daughter myself and are quite intrigued. Well, I, I think they're much emotionally smarter than we were. I, I think they're actually academically 
better taught. I mean, my daughter's at a comprehensive school in North London. I went to a comprehensive school in North London. And, you know, even comprehensive school education is, is just leagues ahead. And, and, you know, the praise they get and the encouragement they get is, is leagues ahead of what we got. Um, so I think they've got a lot to process, you know, what with that and sort of being fairly growing up at the beginning of the internet, I, I think they've got a lot to process. And I can't, I don't think you can expect a young generation to be too outgoing whilst so much is incoming, really. And, and I just think they, they yeah. need time. I don't know, what do you think, John, about I agree, the, um, I think you're entirely right, yes. Yeah. So, you know, I think, and then, you know, maybe they don't want to be stars so much, not, not the smart ones, you know, maybe they don't mind, you know, going to Calais and helping, maybe they see that as radical, you know, and I think if you're in a privileged position, that's, yeah, that's what you should be doing, you should be enabling and helping, and that is more radical, you know, or be even wanting to, you know, compared to when I left school, I had no options, I thought, well, I can either be a teacher or a policewoman, a primary school teacher or a policewoman, my daughter thinks, no, I don't want to be an architect, you know, I don't want to be a doctor, God no, no, oh God no, I hate science. But there's no thought that she can't be those things. She, she's actually got, same, you know, in those 40 years, the difference in choices young women have got, even though, you know, you may say they don't seem radical, they've got so many choices. Um, so, yeah, and that's quite radical in itself, that she could be a scientist, you know. She, she knows of female lawyers. I knew of nothing like that, no women who did anything like that. So, you know, that's, that's radical, really, to have the choice, and let's see what they do with it in their own time, you know. Great. Gentleman back here. Um, I would like this question for both of you, actually. I'm quite interested in the period that followed where, what we're talking about today. I mean, a lot of bands that came from the, the sort of 76, 77 period, by 78, 79, a lot of them were kind of unrecognisable, solidly. Do you think that any of the bands, I mean, in terms of the Smiths as well, uh, the Slits, sorry, do you think a lot of the bands were under any pressure at all from record labels to actually learn how to play and actually move into that more commercial market? Well, I'll just say quickly about the Slits, and John got a better overview than me, but basically, as we kept playing, we got better. And then as we kept hearing, you know, you'd hear Don Cherry or someone turn you onto this record or that record, you'd learn another chord or copy something, of it, and, and it just was organic from the Slits' point of view. But what do you think? I agree. I agree. Well, I mean, the Slits are a very good example, and there were other, other groups um, that used the energy from punk and used more, most particularly the DIY aspect. Um, because, in fact, wasn't your first LP on, on Dick O'Dell's label? That, was a, that uh, was a DIY thing, wasn't it? No, well, Island it was. Island, it was yeah. Island. Well, the, 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 the demos he put out, wasn't that one? on Y Records. Oh yeah, that was later then. Yeah. So, there were, so there was a lot of independent labels, and so you have, people had the freedom to experiment. And so the new, I always liked punk because it was new, and obviously it stopped being new <laughs> when it got old. And, <laughs> and so new for me was in, seven, in 78, 79, was a kind of mixture of what had been going on with, um, with reggae, um, with funk, with more black music, and with electronic music. And so that, to me, in a way, musically, although I loved punk, I loved the distorted guitar, Pill. I loved all that. Pill. Yeah, Pill was a fantastic example. What bands would you say, then, had done that, you know, had shifted sonically so much? Pill, yeah. I think we got more confident, yeah. I mean, you know, the Clash as well, you know, of course, you know, besides the CBS, how the Clash sonically changed dramatically within about two years. Did they? I think so. From, from I'll the, probably from stop the listening then. <laughs> yeah. yeah. um, so. I have to admit, I've gone back and listened to Clash recently. I enjoyed them much more than I did at the time. Really? I'd stopped. I stopped listening to them as well. I didn't particularly like Give Them Enough Rope. It seemed to me quite overblown and kind of American-type rock thing. Um, and uh, I really, really did like the first album. Um, but I was less interested in The Clash by 78, 79, like a lot of people, perhaps unfairly, because I think Combat Rock's a very good record. Um, and actually, I really like the last Clash album that everybody hates, Cut the Crap. <laughs> I think it's brilliant. Um, but, uh, you know, I was long gone. I mean, uh, the punk burnt itself very out. Punk burnt itself out very quickly for me. And, um, 
it was, it was, I, I just became obsessed with electronic music. I've loved electronic music ever since, because that again seemed new, and I was looking, always looking for something that was new, not cliched, um, and that was of most import to me, really. And, you know, there was such a, for a lot of punk group, British male punk groups in particular, it was such a straight jacket. It was like you know, one, two, three, four, Ramalama Ramones. And, you know, great when the Ramones did it, but uh, that was, you know, a year and a half before. Time for one more, one or two more. <laughs> uh, this is a question for both of you. Um, I was... When I look back at um, my childhood and thinking about punk rock, which massively formed me as a person, um, every band you've mentioned massively formed me as a person, as I'm older, I can contextualise culturally um, mostly individual players, to my, to my own satisfaction, rightly or wrongly, I can contextualise culturally most of the individual players within punk rock. Um, I mean, I've come down to the conclusion that everything that fascinated me, fascinated me about um, the Sex Pistols, for instance, probably came through Malcolm and Vivian. Um, the records of the Sex Pistols, exciting as they are, are fairly traditional to my mind, mm. but other than John Lydon. Now, the one person that I can't contextualise in punk rock you can see where the clash came from, you can see where the dam came from. And I was wondering whether either of these could account culturally or contextualise where John Lydon came from. <laughs> well, he's Irish for a start. <laughs> so am I. So am I. I'm, my father's Irish, I'm getting an Irish passport, thanks. <laughs> thanks, Dad. Um, uh, I've only just remembered this, because uh, he only lived in Ireland for a year. Um, <laughs> I think um, Leiden was the wild card in the Sex Pistols. And I mean, I, I don't think it's fair to say that the Sex Pistols were entirely Malcolm and Vivian. I think they all, yeah. they all put towards it. And, you know, I think Glenn was a great songwriter, great bass player, and an arranger. He was the arranger of the group. And after he left, the Sex Pistols didn't really have songs. They had barrages, which bodies, bells of the gas, etc., which were something different but they weren't the songs that Glenn helped to write. Um, I think Leiden had the ability to channel everything for that period. He had the ability to channel quite deep things, possibly unconsciously. He had the ability to turn what was going on in the society into incredible lyrics and then front them out in an extraordinary way. For that, he deserves eternal credit. Viv? <laughs> I agree. <yeah. laughs> but let's not deify. You know, we were. You know, the whole time was very against fetishizing, deifying certain people. You know, it really was about we can all do it, one way or another. We've all got a story to tell. You know, yeah. there's no need to sort of lord anyone really. I wouldn't die if I, I wouldn't die if I lied. I think you're just saying you can fool yourself. Sorry, we were insulting you. I think that the person who was in 1976, 1977, isn't the person that he was post 1982. Well, let, let's not let's not get into person, you know. Oh, it's not personal. <laughs> yeah. Just, it, it leads Last to the question. question, and I was wondering whether. Hmm? That's enough, isn't it? On that, that's enough on yeah, that subject. Okay. We have one more, I think. Strict, strict mummy. <laughs> Scolding teacher. Oh, oh, you could be prime minister. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you have any Looks like we might be out of time, actually. Um, one more. Come on, somebody. Put your bloody hand. Go on. on. <laughs> we got one oh, here. Yeah. A lady over here. Oh, but, oh, I'm very curious. Like, because, uh, you know, the whole internet thing, and like you were saying, like, you read about me before you listen to it. But I was just curious. That, um, do you get that same feeling? You know, when you hear a song for the first time, you're like, oh wow, that's amazing. Do you guys still get that feeling? When do you, you hear new music? Do you still get that feeling when you hear new music? Yeah, okay. Excitement. Yeah. That yeah. excitement or that well yeah. of. Yeah, yeah I love John? music. You know, the, people are always making good music. Yeah, new genres. New genres, do you? Yeah, yeah I like. You know, modern electronic music, whatever mm. it is. I and personally I like, can't I like bear any music. <laughs> I like records to sound as though they're made in 2016. I hate, I hate, yeah. one of the reasons I hate modern rock music, it all sounds old. Old, yeah. Mm. I, I, honestly, I don't know what's happened to me. I think I'm post-traumatic stress syndrome, but 
I, I can almost not bear to hear any music. I, I have Radio 4 on all through the night, and I can't... If, if, if any music comes on, I'll quickly change it to Radio 4 Extra or the World Service. I am absolutely... You know, I, I've become hyper-super sensitive to it. Why but, is that, do you think? I, partly, if it's... Partly I don't want to think, which is my own problem, <laughs> which I won't go into now, but as I say, we are all quite damaged people from those times. <laughs> I don't like to think, and, and, you know, music without lyrics can make me too reflective, which is all right during the day, but not at night. But the other thing is, do I want someone who hasn't thought a lot about what they're saying ranting in my head anymore? You know, repeating every, three, every one minute a phrase, which is, you know, just ripped off from a phrase that's been ripped off from a phrase which is not thought about, which is not interesting, it's not going to teach me anything. So it's not that I don't really like music, but... I can't stand the whole concept of the laziness of it because I was, as you, we've all just said, I was mentored and formed in a time when you were rigorous about what you said. And if it was going to go out on a radio or you were going to put it out there. <laughs> eh? <laughs> Hip hop and grime. Yeah, but I'm too old for that. Yeah, grime, I, I must admit, grime is, is, is great. Kano, yeah. But, well, I thought I think they were offended, but I don't think it was thoughtless. It was thought about whether whether they thought it was thoughtless or not. At least it was thought about. Hmm? Yeah, but movement, movement. Who cares? It's something's movement. It's be suspicious. We weren't a movement. We weren't a movement. I'm suspicious. You know, we didn't want to be called punk. We didn't want to be all lumped together. We were individuals who were allowed to be individuals. You know. So, um, yeah, I do agree. I think grime, if we're going to go into music, is the most interesting thing. But I don't think, you know... And I know there's clubs in Croydon and, and South London where you're, they're not allowed to play grime and they're not allowed to have grime nights, you know, it, it, where music is... Actually, the police have banned it. So, yeah, it, there are moments, grime pockets. Grime and Radio 4 is the two things. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but, you know, just... Now, you know, and, it, and it's not actually so much against new genres, but just that I am a bit burnt out and I completely come clean about that. But, you know, and, and whatever your discipline, if you're a scientist or whatever, you're going to be very, very strict about what you accept. You know, and if I was a scientist, I would be reading, you know, pamphlets and magazines and saying, that's a load of rubbish. No, that's not yeah. good. No, they haven't been rigorous in their testing. So that's partly because I've, you know, that's, that's how... That's the punk I've, discipline. That's my punk <laughs> discipline, yeah. So I, I, I won't take any shoddiness. And it's shoddy a lot of it. I do like electronic, uh, yeah. electronic and I, you know, I like that a lot of women play it as well. Yeah. Um, electronic music and glitch and I, you know, I do like that. I was very turned on by Layla's stuff, you know, she's great. Mm. But you know, who, who cares? Who cares about this or that? It's, let's be a bit more sort of, yeah. rather than pick this name and pick that name. And No room for shoddiness, people. Yeah. <laughs> You know, it goes back to the first thing you said. If it's not going to be better or different than what, what went before, that was our maxim. Then don't, don't do, do it. it. Yeah, discipline, yeah. rigour and disgust. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's something that we could say yeah. doesn't really get understood about how rigorous and how hard we worked in those times when there were no buses and no telephones, and no, you know, to organise a rehearsal mm. took a week, you know, mm. and if someone didn't turn up, you couldn't call them, you know. And yet we made something that is still being talked about 40 years later. The rigour is what has kept it mm. relevant. Fantastic. Thanks, everyone. Um, thank you so much, Viv and John. And uh, I'm sure you've all read their brilliant books, but if you haven't, read them. And read all the other books they write as well. Signing in the shop. <laughs> <laughs> and um, thank you so much for coming. And I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. It's a fascinating wealth of topics we've had there. Thanks for coming. Good.